episode 196, Iron Man Florida with Bonnie Cheever. Welcome to the pursuit of the perfect race. I'm Coach Terry Wilson, and with each episode, I bring stories of athletes to you that share their experiences at races in order for you to learn how to have your perfect race. We'll hear stories from athletes of all ages, abilities, and races of all distances. So regardless of where you fit in, there's something in there for you. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Now let the pursuit begin. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Pursuit of the Perfect Race. Today I have the pleasure of talking with Bonnie Cheever about her recent race at Ironman Florida that took place on November 4th, 2018. The temperature on race day was 65 and rose to 90. Something notable about, notable about this race was that it was moved to Haines City versus Panama, <laughs> Panama City Beach. And she's being coached by Dave Jimenez with Octanian Athletics. She has a great deal of information to share and this was not her first. And I look forward to diving into your race. Bonnie, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're welcome. So what made you want to do this race in the first place? Well, I've never raced two full iron distance races in one calendar year. And just with kind of what my personal life has looked like lately, it's just been a little bit chaotic. And I decided to do a later season race um, so that I could have the discipline of training um, through the summer and fall. Okay. Yeah. So how was your training going into this race? Um, it was definitely different. Um, it was definitely different training through the summer because typically I race Texas in April. And so I trained through the winter. And so training through the summer was really, really challenging. It was super hot. <laughs> um, and then through the fall, it rained like every weekend. And so that was tough. I spent a lot of time on the trainer this year as opposed to for some of my earlier races. Um and I also crashed my bike um, in August and um, had to be out for just a couple of weeks. And coming back from that was a little bit slow. And um, so it was a little bit different training for this one, but um, I definitely enjoyed it. Okay. So, what kind of training are you using? Are you using heart rate training, power based training? What is this like? Yeah, I use both of those. Um, I've trained for most of my races on heart rate and I just got a power meter for this race. Um, and so that's been a learning experience for sure. Trying to understand all of my power numbers and figure out how to really use that most effectively. Um, but I still really enjoy using heart rate, um, on the bike and obviously on the run as well. Nice. And you're actually using Dave, which coached me to my first full and now you're using him too. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Dave's wonderful. I've known him really since I became a triathlete in the first place. And um, now he's coaching me really specifically. And I've just improved a ton under his coaching. And so he's been absolutely wonderful. Nice. So going into this race, knowing that you were going to do this race and Texas this year, what was it like going from the recovery in April down to getting the miles back up? to Florida? Um, it was tough, um, because typically I take off much more time than that. Um, but I, I took about a month, um, where I was still doing workouts, but there were a lot lower intensity, a lot um, less hours per week. But after about a month, I was kind of back on it. Um, which was tougher than I thought. Um, just being used to taking, you know, two or three months off. Um, But ultimately that's what you have to do when you race two races like that in a year. And so um, I knew that going into it at least. Right. So going into this race in the previous four months, what was your longest swim, bike and run workouts? Well, my swim training was completely inadequate. What do you mean? (laughs) I, I did about 14 swims preparing for this race and the longest one was about three eh, about 3500 um yards and so I definitely didn't put in the swim training that I that I maybe could have but that was definitely a choice that I uh, made with Dave knowing that my you know my back is swimming from when I was four till 18 and so I'm really comfortable in the water and typically do well on the swim with little training and so 
Um, so I didn't, I didn't do a lot of swimming, but I did a lot on my bike. My, my longest bike ride was six hours. Um, and I did that on my trainer. <laughs> oh my. It was very long, <laughs> but, um, but it was good. And my longest run was actually longer than I've ever done before for any training ever, um, which was three hours and 15 minutes. Um, and so I went 21 and some change miles on that run, which was after my longest bike ride the, the day after. And so that was extremely challenging. Wow. So for the run, was it broken up or was it a straight run? What was this like? Um, straight run. Yeah. Sunday long run. Um, went out before the sun came up and just, you know, put it down. Always, uh, most of my long runs, I shoot for, um, negative splits. So that's what I was aiming for. And that's what I did on my longest training run. Wow. So are you doing a lot of bricks in training? Definitely. Definitely. Um, not so much during the weekdays, uh, maybe an occasional weekday brick, but definitely my Saturday long rides. I always, um, follow them with a run. No doubt. How long are those runs? Anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and a half is the longest one that I did after a ride. And then the next day you're still doing a long run. Mm hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. To get, to get my legs used to being really tired and still having to run really far. Right. What about strength training? Are you doing strength training as well? Not a lot, not a lot, mostly just like stretching type, um, work, but not a lot of like weights or heavy lifting or kettlebell work or anything like that. I, I should. Yeah. <laughs> But unfortunately, I have this full time job that gets in the way of all of the training <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so, what workouts did you do that gave you the confidence to go into this race prepared? I mean, it's obviously not your first rodeo, so right? You, it's you know that you can do it the distance, but you still want to check off some boxes mentally that you can go into this race knowing that you can do it right. Right? Yeah, I think I think really all of my longest training days are what gave me that confidence, you know, that uh, literally the day before I raced, I was looking back at my longest runs, um, and seeing, wow, I, I did, you know, a seven hour workout the day before that. And then I was able to run at a, you know, nine, 10 pace or a nine minute pace or whatever on really tired legs. And, you know, it, it's different in training versus in a race, but, but knowing that, you know, those Sundays when I didn't feel like running for three hours, I was still able to. And so, um, those were really key for me being like, okay, I can, I can do this and I can, I can hold a really challenging pace. Um, even when I get tired. All right. So did you miss a lot of training? I didn't miss a lot of training. Um, for when I took a spill on my bike, um, I missed some and I traveled some, um, on my weekends. And so some of my miles were treadmill miles and, um, <laughs> spin bikes in gyms, um, which is not ideal, but, but really I hit about 90% of my training, I would say. Wow. So if we take a look at all of the training that you did going into this race, what was the most hours that you trained in a week compared to Ironman Texas earlier this year? Um, probably my longest training week was 14 or 15 hours, which is pretty typical for how I've trained for all my other Ironmans, honestly. Um, and those hours might look a little bit different, but it's around the same number. Okay. So were there any days where you just didn't want to train? <laughs> Is that a real question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Most days I do not wake up and want to train. <laughs> you don't go, yes, I get to get on my trainer for six hours a day. Yeah, it's weird. I don't just hop up and want to get into my, you know, Speedo and hop in a cold pool. Um, yeah, most days you don't want to train. Motivation is kind of a luxury, um, but 
you do the work knowing that you will, you know, get the glory, so to speak, on race day of, of having an amazing race and and knowing all the hours that you put in when you did not want to do that. So, wow. Yeah. So how do you get past that mental block of not wanting to do the workouts, but still doing them? Um, well, I think for, for your first big race, fear, (laughs) fear of not understanding how far a race like this is and not knowing and just, I guess, respecting the distance, um, and, and, you know, swallowing that I don't want to feeling and saying, no, 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 I know that I'm training for something bigger. Um, but I think less about fear when you're doing a, you know, a distance that you've done before and more just about wanting something better for yourself, you know, looking back at previous races and saying, okay, I did, you know, 12 and a half hours. I did 12 hours. I did whatever you did and saying, I I know that I want better for myself and, and just keeping that end goal in mind, I think is, is what does it for me anyways. Right. So a lot of your training was inside and I know you're training up to 14, 15 hours a week. You also have a full-time job. How big of an issue is balancing life, work, and training? Um, It's definitely challenging. Um, It's really, really tough. It takes a lot of discipline and you've got to be um, a little bit selfish with your time sometimes. You know, you have so many things that are pulling you in so many different directions and you've got to um, be able to gracefully say no to things. Um, You know, when you have friends asking you to stay out late or you have people asking you to go on trips or whatever, it's okay to say no to those sometimes. And, and people don't understand that, but you've just got to be really, um, really disciplined is the only word that I have about, how you're spending your hours. You know, if you're sitting in front of the TV, are you foam rolling? Are you stretching? Um, those kind of things, just so that all your time is really intentional because there's not enough hours in the day. There just aren't. Right. And that 15 hours isn't taking into account the foam rolling, the stretching, all of that. That's just actual workout time. Yep, exactly. That's not driving to workouts or pumping up my tires or loading up my bike gear or you know, prepping all my nutrition or any of that. That's strictly swim, bike, run. Wow. So with nutrition, what are you using for nutrition? This season, I mostly use Cliff products. Um, I I like, um, they have these pouches. I think they're called real food pouches and they have all these different flavors. Um, and this season I was mostly training with banana ginger beet flavor um it's like a little applesauce pouch that you would give to like a child um but it's just it's real food and i really appreciate (laughs) real food when i've been sucking down sugary goos and you know eating those sugary cliff blocks um i really appreciate taking in some real food and so cliff bars of different flavors a lot of the nut butter filled ones i've been eating um But I also really, most people find this disgusting, but I also really like the margarita pizza flavored Cliff Pouch. Um, It's literally like a slice of pizza blended and put into a pouch that you suck down. So um, it's wonderful if you can get past the fact that it's like (laughs) a blended slice of pizza. Gosh. Uh Uh-huh. Man, so what about your day-to-day nutrition? A lot of people struggle with maintaining or losing weight during Ironman training. How did Mm -hmm. you combat this? Because you're working out 15 hours a week, training for six hours at a time sometimes. Mm -hmm. What is this like for you? Um, Weight has been a real – weight hasn't been a real challenge for me, honestly. I've been within about two pounds of my current weight for about eight years. (laughs) So, and that weight looks a little bit different as I'm, you know, ramping up my training, it'll look a little bit more muscular and it'll look a little bit leaner. Um, 
but that that hasn't historically been a problem for me fortunately because i have you know no kids and i'm 28 um i think as you get older it gets a little bit more challenging but um you know i i try and eat decently um when i can try and get in a few salads a week and um i really enjoy roasted vegetables um but you know sometimes i'm eating cliff bars for <laughs> meals and sometimes I have you know a bag of Cheetos or whatever um so it's definitely an area that I could improve on um but it's just a time commitment to um to meal prep and and do it the right way and so that's kind of been my struggle so far do you meal prep uh not typically no I have before but it's it hasn't been something I've done much this season okay Mm-hmm. So to transition a little bit and actually start get, getting to the race, what was your taper like going into this race? My, my taper was about two weeks, um, which is typical for me. Um, the week before, I still had a three-hour ride and 30-minute run on Saturday. And then I think I had a two-hour run um, two weeks out. Um, but from there, it you know, really started to scale back. Um, still a little bit of intensity, um, some like intervals on my bike, um, and some, some quicker paced runs, but, um, just less hours, um, which is always lovely. Yes. (laughs) So when did you actually want to start looking at what was going on with the weather situation because on October 12th or 13th, it was something along in there. They actually had the hurricane come through Panama city. And Mm -hmm. were you paying attention to this of, Hey, they might cancel the race. What was all this like? Yes. Right. By the time you hit taper now, then, Oh, the city's destroyed. Right. Right. Yeah. I had my blinders on. So I, I was going into my longest weekend of training when Hurricane Michael hit. And I knew that it was a very real possibility that we couldn't race. And I just was like, no, 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 I have to stay focused this weekend. And I have to put in all of the work that needs to be put in this weekend and just expect that I'll still get to race. Um, Cause if I started to get in my head I knew bad things were going to happen and I wouldn't have the training that I needed to. And so I literally shut off the news. I didn't check my personal email anyways. And um, somebody would mention Hurricane Michael. And I was like, uh, respectfully, please, please don't show me pictures and please don't talk to me about it because I need to be training because I have a race coming up. Um, And so that was kind of my attitude. And Iron Man put out a an email that said, Hey, we'll make a decision by end of day on Tuesday. And so, I mean, Tuesday was a little bit nerve wracking for sure. Um, waiting and refreshing my email all day, but, um, you know, I'm thrilled that they were able to make this happen. I mean, it takes a year to plan these events. I mean, this is a full-time job for them. And so to pull it together, um, change location in three weeks is just amazing. And I'm so thankful that Iron Man was able to do that. Wow. So whenever they actually announced that they were going to move the venue to Haines City, what was your first thought on this? Oh, I was pumped. I was pumped and I am sitting on my bed and, you know, crying a little bit, whatever, it's fine. And crying because I'm happy. Um, And I'm like, okay, now I need a place to stay. And so, I mean, I immediately went to Airbnb and change my reservation and call my mom and I'm like mom we're going to Haines City um so I I was pumped being that you're driving to Florida did you realize that it was going to add about another five hours (laughs) yes I did (laughs) so that's another 10 hours in the car right right yeah oh yeah I realized but I'm like I did the training and I I need I need to go race. I'm ready for this. Wow. So Mm -hmm. what about the course itself? Because the course that they put together is not what you were training for because Florida is known for being flat ish. And (laughs) this was not a flat ish course. 
Right. Oh, yeah. Go to Florida, they said. It'll be flat and fast, they said. It was not flat and it was not fast. <laughs> so, but I mean, at that point, there's nothing to do. You look at the course and you mentally prepare yourself like, okay, this is going to be a lot harder than I thought that it would be. And we'll just see what happens. <laughs> so whenever they actually announced the course, what did you and Dave come up with for a game plan for this course? Um, I, we didn't really change the plan, honestly. Um, he had some really lofty goals for me that I think on a different day, I absolutely could have made happen, um, on a flatter course. I think that I could have made it happen. Um, but no, he's like, you're, you're ready for this. And I knew that I was ready. And, um, so we didn't change the plan. He's like, go, go take care of business, go do something amazing. So that was what I was shooting for the whole time. <laughs> wow. So when did you actually want to start traveling over to Haines City? So I, uh, the race was on Sunday and I left on Thursday night to go down to Houston to pick up my mom. And then we drove all day Friday, left at five in the morning, something like that. And got there at like nine o'clock at night. Um, and so woke up you know, on Saturday, pretty tired, but, um, we, we, we always go and um, volunteer at, um, at athlete check-in. Um, and so we had that on our schedules for Saturday. And after that, made sure I got my packet and organized all my gear bags, dropped it off, dropped off my bike. Um, so it was a little bit more, um, it was a little bit busier than I typically am leading up to a race, but you know, it was all right. Wow. So how was the village here at Ironman Florida this year, being that they moved it? Yeah, it was great. It was great. The The venue was awesome. It was this cute little um, community park. There was um, a nice, like, stage area where I guess they hold, like, music events and playgrounds for the kids and tennis courts and, um, you know, right up against the lake. So it was it was beautiful and well laid out. Um, the thing that they were missing, which I was disappointed – um, they have the big M dot that so many people take photos with at every race. I'm sure you've seen photos of people standing next to this giant life size M dot. Um, and they didn't have that there. So I was really bummed that I didn't get to take a picture with that. But, but other than that, it was awesome. Okay. So how was bike check in for you? Did you want to have your gear laid out a certain way in your bags as well? I did. So before I, or I, even left Dallas, I pack just in grocery sacks of each of what each of my bags will have in them. Um, so that I don't have to lay it all out and then repack it later. So, so yeah, I had all that, um, which made bike check-in and gear check-in really smooth. Um, didn't have any issues. The volunteers were amazing as they always are. And, um, are you talking about yourself here? I don't know if you're Yes, mom and I are great. <laughs> wow. So after you check your bike in, are you wanting to get a certain meal in the night before the race? Or are you monitoring your nutrition all day and wanting to hit a certain nutrition plan for the day? What does this look like from a nutrition standpoint the day before the race? Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually for really the whole week leading up, I try to be a lot more intentional about what I'm taking in, making sure I'm getting, um, just clean nutrition, lots of fruits, lots of veggies, salads, chicken, sweet potatoes, that kind of thing. Um, and it was a little bit different being on the road. Um, but yeah, the day before I was eating chicken salad, grapes, um, my mom brought a whole bag of those little cuties. And so I was eating those like crazy, um, and then when we were volunteering, um, there was pizza. So I had a slice of pizza. <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> blended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't tell my coach. Um, <laughs> um, it tasted awesome, but, um, probably not what I should have been eating the day before. But, but besides that, it's mostly like chicken, um, uh, fruits, vegetables, you know, bananas. So pretty clean. So what was for dinner the night before the race? Um, chicken salad. <laughs> My mom made a large carton of it that we ate over the course of like three days. Um, 
before we even left Houston. So, so yeah, that and um, I think I had half a peanut butter bagel. Um, yeah, some grapes and some cuties. Wow. <laughs> so mm-hmm. as you're going to bed the night of the race, what is your mindset of wanting to go to sleep at a certain time and wake up at a certain time? What was this like? Mm-hmm. Um, so the race was, it was earlier, an earlier start than any of the other ones that I've done. And so I woke up at 3.30 um, to leave the house by 4 to get to transition by 4.30, um, which is when it opened because the race started at 6.30. Um, so that was a really early wake up. Thankfully, it was daylight savings time ending until we got an extra hour of sleep. Um, but I was in bed by probably 8.45 and probably asleep by 9.30 and um, slept like a rock, quite frankly. I typically have a little bit of trouble sleeping, but I um, I don't know. I just was ready to, to go do the thing. So slept like a rock and woke up ready to take care of business. Nice. So before you leave your Airbnb, what's your morning ritual like before you leave your apartment or Airbnb? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I had all my clothes laid out. And so hopped into my clothes, used the restroom, um, ate a peanut butter bagel. And typically I have fruit to go along with it, but I, I just wasn't very hungry on race morning. Um, and so that, as soon as I wake up, start drinking water, getting a little bit of Gatorade in me. Um, yeah, get, grab my special needs bags, make sure that those are, are topped off with everything that they need. Sometimes I have last minute nutrition that I want to put in them. Um, top off my Garmin, you know, plug it in for a few minutes and make sure it's sitting right at a hundred percent battery. Um, yeah. Load it up and take off. Cool. So what are you putting in your special needs bags? I'm kind of a minimalist, so I don't put a lot. Um, in my bike special needs, I put an extra CO2 cartridge, um, a spare or an extra tube, um, a couple Band-Aids, a couple Tums, um, a carbonated drink of some sort. Just if I, you know, if my stomach's having a little bit of issues and I just kind of need to like get a burp out, quite frankly. Um but that's typically all that I put in there. Um, a couple band-aids if I didn't mention that. And then in my run bag, um, obviously no CO2 or spare tube, but band-aids, Tums, and then, um, an extra pair of socks. Just if for some reason my socks end up soaking wet and I need, I need a clean, dry pair. Um, I have those in there. Okay. And what about your bike and run bags? What are you putting in those? Um, well, all of my clothes, because I change clothes completely. Um, I, I didn't have to change clothes to get on my bike because I just swam in what I rode in. Um, but, you know, socks, bike, shoes, helmet. Um, I have nutrition in there. I have like a concentrated um concentrated little maybe six ounce shot of of whatever I've trained with that year so it could be like a BCAA kind of mix or this year I just did used Gatorade endurance formula um so something to just take down since you know I spent the last hour and 20 minutes not taking in nutrition I want to kind of jump start getting my calories um like back up so that, and I usually, this year I sucked down a, one of those real food packages that one of the cliff products, um, and chamois butter. Can't forget the chamois butter, um, bike gloves. So, so yeah. And then the, when I get to the run, I completely change clothes there too. Cause I just, I want to be as comfortable as possible. Um, so yeah, nothing really special, I would say. Um, other than just my, my clothes, my hat. Okay. So as you actually get ready to go down to the race site, did you have to worry about parking or was your mom dropping you off? What was this like? 
No, it, parking wasn't bad. We were just in this little neighborhood, um, which oddly enough had tons of parking for people. We just were parking, you know, in front of people's houses. Um, and we got there early enough that it, it wasn't a struggle, thankfully. Okay. So as you're getting to transition, what all are you doing in transition before you actually head down to the swim start? Mm-hmm. Um, really, all I had to do was pump up my tires because um, I deflated them a little bit the day before. Make sure that my Garmin was set up on my bike so that I could, you know, hop on my bike and just turn it on. And it had already connected to satellites and all of that. Um, top off my hydration. So I have a, a front um, bottle that, you know, sits between the handlebars. And so make sure that was full. Um, and that's all I really had to do in transition, um, at my bike anyways. And then I went to my gear bags and topped off the nutrition in there. Um, and also (laughs) I put caution tape, um, around the top of my gear bags and I don't want people to steal my idea. And so I always leave that to race morning and I go and I put caution tape and tie a ribbon around it using that. It makes it really easy to find my bags. You know, I see people using like colorful duct tape on their bag, but the caution tape like sticks up above the bag. And so it's really easy for my eyes to find it after I get out of the water. Nice. Mm Mm-hmm. So as you're actually leaving transition, heading down to the swim start, you know it's going to be wetsuit legal at this point. Are you going to use a full sleeve, a sleeveless, or even wetsuit at all? Um, I decided not to wear one. Um, really? The water, the water was 73, and I just went and dipped my feet in and was trying to gauge how I was feeling, and it just felt balmy to me. <laughs> I'm like, I just couldn't imagine crawling into a wetsuit at that point. Some Just something about how I was feeling, I just didn't think that I could get myself into a wetsuit. And I didn't think that I needed one anyways, um, just because I feel really comfortable in the water. And it was a small lake that we were swimming in, and so I didn't have the chop of the ocean. Um, and so I decided to go without one and I was one of the very few people who <laughs> made that choice or didn't have a wetsuit in some people's case. Um, but in the end I was happy with my choice. I was pretty warm in the water, um, during the race. Okay. So preparing for this swim, it's a little bit different. This is a two loop swim, but this swim is not an easy navigatable swim, if that makes sense, because there's right. a few turns. I say a few, there's probably like seven turns per lap, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, uh-huh. so, something like that. So how did you want to navigate the swim for you? Um, well, I think going into the water, knowing the course is really important. Um, cause you get out there and you do start looking around and kind of questioning and a little bit panicking and being like, am I, am I going the right way? Did I miss the swim? Did I miss the turn or did I miss the turn buoy? Um, you know, but just going in fully prepared and knowing how many buoys you are going to be passing on each side before you got to turn, um, is really what I do to, to make sure that I am going into the water confident uh, but it definitely was challenging. All those turns get really congested um, and a little bit more aggressive, you might say. Right. And there was also on the course here a place where they channeled all of the volu- – or not all the volunteers, all the athletes through for a uh, timing mat as well, right? Right. Yep. You got out of the water and um, ran over a timing mat and um, got a drink of water if you wanted to and then went back in. Wow. So before you actually start your race, what was your goals for your race? Did you have a time goal for each leg, an overall time? Um, I had pace goals for each leg. Um, the swim, I would have really, I was going to be happy with anything under an hour 20 is what I told my mom. Um, just because I didn't train for it. Um, in my, 
my best swim is a 113. And so knowing that I hadn't trained for it, I'm like, okay, anything 120 or under is going to be good for the training that I've done for the swim. Um, on the bike, um, Dave wanted me to average 21. Um, he absolutely believes that I can do that. I don't know that my confidence was there in that pace. Um, but I was really hoping to average over 20 on the bike. And then on the run, I, I really would have liked to go under four hours on my marathon. Um, but you know, goals are goals <laughs> for a reason. <laughs> yes. Wow. So you want to get about a 11 and a half hour a day. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been lovely. <laughs> what did you get at Texas this year? At Texas, I did a 1047. Okay. But that's so, also a shortened course too. Um, The bike was, oh, I think 110 um, miles, but it's a very different course for sure. Um, much flatter and the, the weather was flawless at Texas this year. So. All right. So going into this race, they have a rolling start. Where did you see yourself at? I seated myself with the one hour to one ten finishers. Um, so one, um, group faster than the group that I really thought that I should have been in. Um, just so that I could try and draft off some faster people and eventually settle into really my pace group and find, find somebody that I could draft off of easily. Okay. So as the gun goes off, you get into the water. How's your swim go for you? It went well. Um, you know, I think the first maybe 200 yards are always, you know, elevated heart rate and a little bit panicky and trying to not get swam over. Um, but I, I settled in pretty quick and I, um, I drafted probably, I don't know, maybe 30% of the whole swim, um, which I was really thankful that I did. I came out of the water and honestly was like, wow, that was, <laughs> that was totally fine. Like I'm not feeling exhausted at all. Um, and so, yeah, I felt, I felt good. And obviously my time wasn't, it wasn't a PR or anything, but with how I was feeling and how much energy I had, um, as opposed to some of the time when I've gotten out of the water, um, I felt good. Wow. Mm -hmm. So uh, comparing the two loops, the first and the second loop, how were they in comparison to each other? Um, the second loop was a lot less congested, um, as you could imagine, I'm sure. So that was nice, a little bit calmer. Um, and I was able to draft a lot more in the second loop. Um, so that was definitely nice, but, but really pretty similar for me. I think my pace was a little bit slower in the second loop, but pretty, they were both pretty okay. Okay. So did you know that there was going to be a hole after the, near the swim exit? Did you find that? What do you mean a hole? Uh, so you would start walking and then you'd have to start swimming again before the swim out. Um, did you find that? No. Okay. Well, <laughs> other people did. So, okay. Oh, no, I, I don't know about that. Yeah. So after you get done with the swim, you're going into T1 and you're getting ready for the bike. How does T1 go for you? T1 was good. Um, the fact that I didn't have to change clothes was really lovely. Um, yeah, it went pretty smooth. The volunteers and the volunteers tier tent are amazing and I would absolutely recommend people utilizing those volunteers. Um, yeah, they're awesome. They do everything for you. You know, I'm barking orders at them and like, I need my gloves. I need my, you know, X, Y, Z, like open my, um, open my nutrition for me and, and they just did everything. And so, um, 
so yeah, it went, it went pretty smoothly. It was a really long transition, um, from the water to the changing tent and then to the bike. Um, so our, everybody's times were a little bit slower than a lot of races, but, but yeah, it went pretty smoothly. Nice. So as you get out on the bike, how does the first few miles of the bike ride go for you? The first, the first really 20 to 25 miles were really great. Um, so I was just spinning pretty easy the first five minutes, something like that, five or 10, um, just to bring my heart rate back down and kind of settle in mentally. Um, but the first, first half of the loop, since it was a two loop course, the first half was really flat. Um, which was awesome. So I was, I wasn't holding the 21 that, um, you know, I ultimately had the goal of, but, but I was holding probably 20 miles an hour pretty consistently on, you know, that flat first half, um, which I was happy with. Okay. So what about from a power perspective? Did you have a power goal that you wanted to hit on here? I did. I was mostly shooting for around 123. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's definitely an area that I still have a lot to learn about, um, particularly with doing so much of my training this season on the trainer, um, you know, where you set your power and then you just, and it's very different being out on the road. And so uh, I mostly went off of heart rate and feel and pace, um, to be totally honest with you, but power is definitely something that I had on my, on my screen and was trying to gauge that and make sure I wasn't overdoing it. Um, especially like climbing hills and, um, and that kind of thing. Okay. So how did you want to look at the power to help you have a better bike split? Did you want to have like a normalized power go an average power, 10 second average? What was this like? Yeah, I was going off of average, um, average power. Um, and honestly, I don't really know the difference between average and normalized to be quite frank with you, but, um, I was going off of average. Okay. So what about cadence? Did you want to hit certain cadences on the heels or flats? What was it? Yeah, I tried to hold uh, just a steady cadence on all types of terrain. Um, I was shooting for between 85 and 90. Um, and at the end of it all, I averaged 88. And so that's, it's a something that I don't have to think about really now that I've, um, you know, been on my bike for as long as I have, um, that that comes a little bit more naturally than, you know, say the power or, um, heart rate. Nice. So how are the aid stations here on the bike course? Do you, do you have enough time to get what you needed and get rid of what you didn't? Um, that's always a challenge. <laughs> it's a little bit chaotic. You're trying to not crash your bike or hit a volunteer or whatever. Um, but yeah, they laid, they lay them out pretty well and pretty spread out. Um, so yeah, I definitely had enough time to get what I wanted typically, um, sometimes if I wanted two food items, uh, I wasn't able to because they usually only have one volunteer passing out each specific thing. Um, and so if you miss it, you, you know, you got to wait 10, 12, 14 more miles before you have another opportunity. And so that was a little bit challenging, but that's why you always bring nutrition with you so that you don't get into a spot where you need it and don't have anything. Right. So what were you wanting to do from a nutrition aspect? I know you were wanting to get about 180 calories an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so that was between Gatorade, um, just taking in their endurance formula and, you know, the different cliff products that I was using. Um, and I, I did that pretty well. Um, I typically try and eat every hour, um, it depends really how I'm feeling and how much I'm drinking every half hour to hour. Um, something that is really, um, scheduled, you know? And so 
this race, I was taking in salt every on every hour and I was taking in nutrition every 30 minutes. Um, and I know some people do 20 minutes or 15 or whatever, but I just, I can't take in that many calories. I know that I can't, and I don't want to get nauseous and I don't want to get to a point where I can't take in anything else. And so I go every 30 minutes typically. What kind of salt were you using? Um, good question. I actually don't remember. <laughs> wow. So what about the quality of the road here? Was it good, bad, indifferent? It was good. It was good. Um, no real issues that I can remember. Um, you know, occasional pothole or something, but overall it was nice. Nice. So did you see a lot of flats or mechanicals or even any wrecks? I didn't see any wrecks, praise God. Um, I did see a number of mechanicals, um, which I think that happens with a hillier course. Um, but no, it, it looked, um, it looked like people had a pretty, you know, good race, um, for the most part, which was a nice change of pace from Texas this year, which gosh, there were so many wrecks and so many flat tires and and all that, but no, Florida was great. Nice. So how are you feeling after you pass the special needs? Did you get anything in special needs that you put in there? No, I never, I've never stopped at any special needs ever. Knock on wood that I continue that pattern. Um, but no, felt fine. I always enjoy passing special needs and, and having this small mental boost of no, 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 I'm feeling good. I don't, I don't need to stop. I don't need to get off my bike. Like I'm just going to keep going. Um, and knowing that other people are stopping and, and seeing that as like a, a small victory, I would say. Nice. So as you approach miles 80 and 90 and getting closer to a hundred, how are you feeling mentally? Are you feeling pretty good? Because usually that's where a lot of the demons come out and play. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The demons started like when I started the second loop. Um, yeah, I, I was not feeling great. <laughs> what do you mean? I, everything was hurting, you know, my lower back was killing me. My shoulders and my neck were killing me, my hands and obviously my legs and just everything. I, I just, in those miles, it's like, oh my gosh, this is never going to end. I have so many more miles, um, you know, but you just, you keep spinning and you just do what you can to not stop. Um, I think that's where people really get into trouble is when, when you mentally give yourself permission to stop. And I, I never have stopped on any ride that I've done, um, during a race. And I think it's because it's not even an option in my mind. Um, because once I get off of my bike, <laughs> it's going to be really tough to get back on. And so, um, that's just kind of a standard I have for myself and unless something's really going wrong, um, that I'm not, I'm just not allowed to stop. And so that's, that's what you do. And that's how you fight the demons is no, 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 this is not a, it's not an option. I keep going even though it hurts. Right. So whenever you start going to negative places, I'm sure you have the thought process of why am I out here in the first place? And mm -hmm. what is your reasoning for this? Yeah. Um, good question. Um, I mean, I love, I love this sport and I love more specifically Ironman and iron distance. Um, and I think big picture, one of the reasons that we all do it is to be able to take on something so big and so scary and so challenging and come out on top, um, you know, and that coming out on top looks different for different people. Um, but just to take on something that's so special and so hard. Um, and so that's, that's really my why, you know, I, I really love about this sport that if you were to see me on the street, nobody's going to be like, wow, that girl looks 
like an athlete. Um, but you get to go out and surprise people in Ironman, you know, and, and just go do something really cool. And so, um, so that's really my why, but, but when I, when I'm really struggling mentally, what I do is I go back through my season and, um, think about all the training, you know, think about all the special different moments and all the different runs and rides and things that I've done, but also go through the people, um, in my life and, and remembering my teammates who helped me on, you know, this one ride or my friends who reached out or, um, people on Instagram and Facebook who don't even know me, who are sending me messages and saying, Hey, like rooting for you, we're tracking you. Um, and just going through all of those people who have helped contribute to even getting me to race day. Um, and that's, quite frankly, a really long list, um, of awesome people. Um, and so that is what helps me get through those miles mm-hmm. is just thinking of the support system that I have that, that helped get me there. Wow. That's pretty awesome. It, oh yeah. <clears throat> I've got the best squad. I mean, it seems like you have a lot of gratitude with your journey along the way as well. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, part of it's about the race and about, you know, the magic of race day, but so much of it is just about like this journey of training and, um, you know, the day to day bits and pieces that aren't so glorious. Right. Because you can remember that six hour trainer ride and you're like, I did not want to do that, (laughs) but you did. And now that your own race day, it makes it that much better. Yeah. Exactly. Or the two and a half hour treadmill run, you know, two and a half hour treadmill run. You didn't mention that. Well, I mean, it's just in any given season, I'll have to do a long run or two on a treadmill, you know, just with bad weather or whatever. Um, so yeah, just all of the different things, you know, touch points along the way that make, make race day fun. Um, are just all those little stories. Wow. So as far as the bike ride goes, being that this isn't your first time doing the Ironman distance, what's some advice that you would give someone that hasn't done a, this bike ride before? Um, don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Do not stop. Um, just don't, you can't let yourself, you know, you've got to I don't know. You've got to practice going to a place of being tired and angry, you know, and, angry. and if you, tr- <laughs> yeah. who's angry here, <laughs> I, I get pretty angry there in those middle miles. <laughs> um, but, I, but I think that people don't practice that. Um, and so, you know, in your training, when you're exhausted in your training, doing the four and five and six hour rides, like you've got to practice feeling angry and not stopping and feeling just that extreme fatigue and and choosing to suffer well, which is a phrase that I feel like I use all the time, but um, really it's a choice to, to suffer and to continue suffering and to figure out how you can get through that suffering um, with a smile on your face without stopping. And so just practicing that in your training. Okay. With all the suffering going on and all these mental battles that you were facing on the later portion of the bike ride here, how well did you execute your bike strategy looking back on it? Um, well, I was shooting for an average pace and with the second half of the course being so hilly that was not feasible for me um so so to answer your question I didn't execute my bike plan um in terms of hitting my goal but I did in terms of nutrition um I stayed really consistent with my nutrition I stayed consistent with my rule of not getting off of my bike. Um, and you know, just stayed in it, stayed disciplined about being an arrow, even when it 
was really painful. And so, um, it, it wasn't the pace that I wanted to hit, but I'm really, I'm proud of the discipline that I had, um, throughout it anyways. So, right. So when did you realize that you weren't going to have the speed or the pace that you wanted on the bike ride? Um, probably mile like 30. (laughs) Okay. So that's relatively early. So that's about an hour and a half to two hours in on the bike of a six hour bike ride. Mm -hmm. So with that, you have to literally one, give yourself some grace and not beat yourself up for the next four hours. Right. How do you do that? Right. Because now you can literally go down this negative spiral of, hating yourself and being mad at yourself for not pushing enough. Hey, you're not worthy enough to be out here. Why are you not pushing enough? I mean, that's a bad negative hole to go down. And a lot of people do that. How do you avoid that? Right. Um, Well, I, I guess just ride with the run in mind. Um, I love the run. Running is really where my background is. Running is my favorite. Yeah. (laughs) It's, It's great. And I would much rather have not the bike that I want, but be able to go run well. Um, Because nobody finishes an Ironman and is like, yes, I had an amazing ride. You know, like you just finished with the marathon. And so like, that's for me kind of where my focus is. And so even when I'm like, wow, I'm not going to be hitting my pace. I'm, I'm not. I'm not where I need to be, then I shift my focus to, okay, I still need to ride well, but I need to ride really smart so that when I get off my bike, I'll still be able to run. Um, Because, I mean, I could have still tried pushing and hitting my pace numbers knowing that I was blowing up my legs, um, but I wouldn't have been able to run. And so that was, that's how I adjust that is like, okay, no, 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 ride well, but ride so that you can go run after this. Okay. So as you're getting closer to T2, the last few miles on the bike, how are you feeling? And are you doing anything to start preparing to start running? Um, yes. Top off my nutrition for sure. Um, make sure I'm taking in salt. Um, but feeling, gosh, so happy, (laughs) so happy to be off of the bike. Um, you know, those last few miles, there's typically more spectators there than there are throughout most of the bike course. Um, and so that's fun getting to come in, come closer, you know, into town, so to speak, and seeing people and waving at them and just getting re-energized by the energy of the crowd and, and mentally thinking through, okay, I've got, I've got, you know, a mile left, two miles left. What do I need to do when I, when I get off my bike, what needs to happen? Where is my gear bag? How am I going to recognize it? What do I need to do in the changing tent? Um, and so shifting your focus to, to, all right, what's next? I need to be efficient about this. Right. So as you get to T2, how does T2 go for you? T2's good. Um, I kind of broke my helmet a little bit, taking it off my head. Yeah. Well, I snapped the visor off, um, which I definitely need the visor. Um, but it's cause I was trying to take it off over my earrings without ripping my earrings out because you know, earrings are important. Um, so, but besides that, um, T2 went, went really well. Um, threw my hat on, totally changed clothes, even changed my socks. Um, cause at that point my socks were full of pee. Um, you pee on the bike? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I usually try to right before I get off the bike, um, just so that I don't have to stop when I start the run. Um, so yeah, right before I get off the bike. And so then later after the race, when I am picking up my gear bags, I have, you know, bike shorts and socks that smell really, really great. <laughs> Sarcasm. Yep. That poor those, volunteer that has to put your bike on the rack. I Well, that, but the volunteer who has to help, like, pick up all my things when I'm changing in the changing tent. Hopefully they're wearing gloves. 
They are, yes. Good. And I tell them, too, I'm like, I just peed, so you guys just take that with, you know, for what it's worth. I'm trying to be honest here. Yeah. Because <laughs> I don't th- want them to think that I sweat and it smells like pee. Like, they should just know that it's pee. <laughs> Poor volunteers. <laughs> so did you put like gift cards in there for the volunteers? I didn't. I really should start doing that. <laughs> Gosh. So as you're getting out of T2, what is your mindset going into the marathon that you have to run? Mm-hmm. Cause you're going to be on the run course for another four hours mm-hmm. at least. What is this yes. like for you? Well, historically I get off, the bike and out of transition and am really tired as you could expect, but also really re-energized of sorts and really excited to be on my favorite leg. Um, but in Florida, I got off my bike and I'm like, I cannot, I cannot run. Like I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do because I am not re-energized. I am mad (laughs) and I don't, I don't feel great. I don't feel that energy that I typically do when I get off my bike. So if we take a, just an objective look at the nutrition plan that you used at Ironman Texas earlier this year and what you did here at Florida, what's the difference of nutrition plans? Um, Honestly, nothing so really. Same I mean, nutrition plan. Yeah, same in terms of like calories and the type of things that I was taking in. Um, I think I ate a few more bananas at Texas, um, and I was going mostly like the <clears throat> excuse me the block chews um, as opposed to the real food pouches. Um, but I was taking in gels um, on both races and taking salt every hour. So really similar nutrition. Okay. So as you're not feeling good going out onto the run, how are you attempting to change your mindset for the run? Um, well, I think I just was like, okay, this is like the first 200 yards of the swim. Like you're a little bit panicky. You're a little bit like, how am I going to do this? You know, this is, this is new. I've got to adjust. I've got to settle in. And so for my first two miles, I was like, let's try and let's try and hit my pace goal. Let's try and do like nine minute miles. Um, even though I'm not feeling good, maybe I'll settle in. And, um, you know, maybe I'll be able to do that. Maybe right now, just mentally, I'm having a hard time. And so my first two miles, they were like a 9.05 and a 9.15, something like that. Um, and so even in my first few miles, I wasn't hitting my goal. Um, but right out of transition was a massive hill, which was pretty rude, if you ask me. Rude. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then the hills just kept, they just kept going. They, it wasn't just right out of transition. It was what I ultimately found to be the whole run was just up, down, up, down. Wow. Mm-hmm. So at this point, did you have any cramping or jazz shoes or did you have any cramping or jazz shoes on the run or bike? No, I didn't. No cramping, no stomach issues. Um, really just mental and emotional issues. <laughs> so whenever you started getting towards a little bit further into the run, after you get out of the way of transition and the spectators, the crowds and all that, mm-hmm. after like the second aid station, how are you really feeling there? Because there's really no crowds around and it's really just you and the athletes out <laughs> there trotting along. Nobody's mm-hmm. around. How are you holding up? Yeah, not well. So my third and fourth miles just got slower and slower. Um, and on my, in my fourth mile, I, was coming up on a big hill and just, I was like, I have to walk this. Um, and I've never walked ever in any of my marathons other than walking the aid stations to take in nutrition. But other than that, I've never walked and I was walking at mile four, um, up this big hill and I 
get about halfway up it. And then I see my mom at the top of the hill and I'm like, uh, like, I'm really glad to see her. Um, but I also know that I'm going to be really honest with her and be like, I feel horrible. And sometimes saying the truth out loud is just the worst. So I was kind of dreading saying that to her that I was feeling so bad. Wow. And this is also comes back to the giving yourself a little bit of grace because just like on the bike ride, now that you have to prepare for a longer run, you have 20 plus miles left at this point Mm -hmm. and you can't sit here and beat yourself up for the rest of this run. You have to say, okay, well those miles suck, but it can get better. Right. Mark. (laughs) Like maybe. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, exactly. My, what my mom said to her, to me, she, she's like, Dave, you know, she was texting Dave through the whole race really. And she's like, Dave says you're doing great. And I'm like, well, Dave's lying because uh, (laughs) I'm doing horribly. (laughs) And she's like, adjust your plan. Just adjust it. You know, whatever that means. Um, And so I spent the next really mild bartering with myself and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to walk the whole thing. I'm going to walk it and I'm just going to talk to people and I don't even care. And then I'm like, no, that's going to take so long to walk the whole thing. Like that's, I'm going to be so angry by the end of it. If I do that, because I'm going to be out there the whole day. Um, And so then I'm like, well, maybe if I just run, you know, two minutes, walk one minute, um, that sounds more feasible. Um, But that didn't really make sense for me because I'm like, if I'm running two minutes, maybe that means I'm running up a hill and then walking down a hill. And that seemed a little bit goofy. And I didn't want to just keep looking at my watch the whole marathon. So anyways, I ultimately decided to go for sub 11 minute miles. Um, that was something that was feasible that I could do. It wasn't too daunting and could still give me a okay marathon. And so that was ultimately my adjusted plan after about mile five. So how did you actually come to this plan? How did you get to this? Yeah. Well, just ruling out terrible options, like walking. (laughs) that would have been a terrible option. Um, and the interval thing, I think for a lot of people, the interval thing is great. Um, but for me, I so focus my runs on talking to spectators and talking to volunteers and waving at people and thanking them and saying, thanks for being out here. Thanks for coming out y'all. Um, really appreciate y'all. Um, and I, and I try and do that really for my whole marathon and, And so looking at the intervals on my watch would have taken away from that. And so I'm like, okay, Vaughn, how can you still be true to what you love about racing and, and your style of racing, which is a very extroverted style of racing, I guess. Um, And what's something that you can still be proud of because race day is one day, but I spend, you know, the next three months telling people the story of race day. And so it's like, how can, how can I still produce something that I'm really proud of? Um, And so for me, that was making sure that I was under 11 minute miles, you know? Um, And for everybody it's, it's different, but that's what I could mentally wrap my head around for that course and how hilly it was. Right. So whenever you say something to be proud of that you're working on, as you're making all these decisions on race day, what are you wanting to actually get from the race itself to be proud of? Um, I think having learned something is important to me. Um, and having, like I mentioned earlier, having suffered well, Um, I've thought about it a lot in the last really year, um, after watching the winner of the Dallas marathon, the female marathon winner. Um, and I mean, we've all seen the amazing stories of these pros who finish a race and they literally can't walk and they're 
legs are giving out and they, their bodies are shutting down. And it's like, we all suffer that same way. We all are hurting in the same way. And, but what makes the pros, the pros is that they choose to suffer and they do it until their bodies collapse. And most of us suffer and then walk or suffer and then shut down. And so that's something that I've worked on really through my training is like, okay, when I'm hurting, I need to choose to hurt, you know? And so that I, I'm continuing to suffer better and better each race, if that makes sense. And so that's a big part of what I focus on getting out of this race is did I suffer better this race than I have before, or did I let the pain win and, you know, walk or whatever. So, so that's what I really was looking to get out of this. Wow. Cause suffering always sucks, but if you know that it's coming, it's a little bit easier. Right. Yeah. And there's ways to, to suffer and shut down and have a miserable race or there's ways to suffer and, and move through that and still have something you're proud of. Wow. So, and this was all within the first six miles of the run. Uh huh. <laughs> you have 20 miles left here. So how does the miles before 12 go in between six and 12? Mm -hmm. Um, they went well, surprisingly, you know, with my new adjusted plan, I'm like, I, I can do this. I, actually think that I can do under 11 minute miles. And so I, you know, kind of got back to my being myself to smiling and to talking to people, other athletes and spectators. And, um, and so that was very re-energizing for me to just kind of force myself to go back to being my friendly self. Um, and then kind of remembering like how fun that is for me to race that way. Right. So what about a nutrition plan for the run? Did you have a different nutrition plan that you wanted to use on the run? Because now you're based off of aid stations unless you're carrying your own. What is right. this like? Right. Yeah. I don't carry any nutrition with me on the run. Um, fully rely on the aid stations. Um, so I always um, take in some kind of calories. I try to every maybe third or fourth aid station take down a goo. Um, but between those, whatever sounds good to me, I eat. And so that's sometimes potato chips, that's sometimes pretzels, sometimes, um, orange slices or grapes or whatever sounds good is what I take. Um, and I try to do Gatorade at about every other or every third aid station. Um, typically I am so tired of sugar that I don't really want to drink the Gatorade, but um, I try to force myself to every second or third um, and then always, you know, chase every calorie with water so that I'm making sure and getting enough water in. Okay. What about Coke or Red Bull? <clears throat> Definitely don't do Red Bull. No? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I am scared of the crash with Red Bull um, and scared of the crash with Coke honestly. And so I hold off on Coke as long as I can. And when I feel like I'm crashing and I feel like I need something, um, is when I go to Coke, um, which this year was at mile 22. Um, I didn't feel like I was crashing, but I just was like, shoot, why not? I haven't, I haven't had caffeine for about two weeks. Cause I always, um, stop taking caffeine starting two weeks before my race. And so, um, typically when I then take it on race day, it's, you know, turbo booster, so to speak. Um, so yeah, but it, it scares me. This, this was the first race that I drank chicken broth. Um, cause with the time change and it being just a different season of the sun going down and all that, um, I was out there until dark and that was new for me. And so as the sun's going down, they pull out the chicken broth and I'm like, I've never tried the chicken broth. It's never been out when I've been on the course. And so I, I had some of that and I did not realize that it was going to be so hot. It like scalded my throat and that was interesting, but it, it did taste um, pretty delicious. Did it? Yeah, it really did. <laughs> wow. Uh, 
Uh-huh. So as far as the run goes, are you you get the special needs on the run course? Did you take advantage of the special needs here? No, I've never stopped at special needs on the run or bike. Um, and I, I just really didn't need it. Um, I, I didn't think I was producing any blisters, which come to find out I had about seven blisters after the race, but my feet weren't really bothering me in that case. Um, my stomach wasn't really bothering me. Um, no, other than just the emotional roller coaster that racing can be. Um, I didn't really have any issues and so didn't stop. Wow. So seven blisters, you didn't feel these on the run course at all? No. <laughs> just kind of overlooked those. I just didn't feel them. I mean, everything was hurting way more than any small blisters. So, I mean, they were all very small and, um, you know, it's always fun taking off your socks after the race and figuring out what your feet look like. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you pass special needs and then you are between miles, say 12 and 18. How are you mm-hmm. feeling here? Because usually these are the lowest of low miles, really unsupported as far as mm-hmm. no spectators. Cause usually everybody's getting something to eat if you are spectating mm-hmm. and it's getting by that time for dinner and nobody's really out there to be out there unless it's volunteers. Mm-hmm. So how are you feeling out there this time? Yeah. Well, fortunately the spectator support was, um, was better than it is in some races because it was a three loop run. And so all the spectators I got to speak to three times, um, which was fun. Um, but yeah, those miles definitely always are tough because you get to, you know, being halfway done and you're like, I still have like, multiple more hours of being out here. And that is definitely daunting. Um, but I mean, I was feeling pretty decent sticking to my plan and most of the Hills I walked up and then ran down and, um, you know, my nutrition felt good and I felt really hot. Um, I know the temperature got up to 90. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was something consistent through the whole run and something that I started saying to my mom when I saw her first at mile two, I'm like, mom, I'm so hot out here. Um, which was pretty atypical. I grew up in Houston and I've raced in Houston many times. And so I'm very used to the heat, but there was something different about that day that I was just, my body was on fire. And so each aid station I'm dumping water under my hat, um, on my head, just trying to cool off. Um, so, I mean, I, I struggled with that for most of the race of just feeling so hot, but, but it wasn't bad enough to really like cripple me or anything. You know, I, I kept hitting my pace goals and, um, kept being disciplined about my nutrition and, you know, made it through those ugly middle miles right? pretty well. So for people that haven't done a full yet, what advice would you give them for the run portion of the marathon or the run portion of the race rather? Mm-hmm. Um, well, the, the approach that I use has been very effective for me and I don't think that it would work for everybody, but but I really spend my time focusing on spectators and volunteers. And I mean, they, they sacrifice so much through this journey too, of supporting their athlete and being Sherpa on race day and dealing with how grumpy and tired and all the things that we as, as athletes deal with. And so, I mean, they've, they've just put in so much to be there. And so, um, so thanking them and, and appreciating them being out on the course, cause that makes our day so much better. And so, um, so that's what I focus on and it takes, it takes my brain out of, I'm angry, I'm tired, I'm hurting and puts the focus on something else and so it makes the miles go by so much easier um you know and especially with a a course that's three loops by the third time that I see them almost I mean so many of them say to me 
yeah, girl, you're still smiling. Like, I can't even believe it, you know? Um, and so then they're initiating the conversation. So I'm not having to put forth so much energy, but I'm still getting um, re-energized by the crowds. And so that's, I recommend that everybody do it, but I, I know that some people don't have that personality that that even sounds appealing. So, um, but it's worked very effectively for me. Right. And I know this is going to backtrack a little bit, but everybody that you work with supports you along your journey as well. And they actually did a lot of stuff in your office for you. Uh-huh. <laughs> like I, I remember seeing that and I was like, wow, that must be cool to work with those people. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're awesome. My coworkers are wonderful and really, really smart and supportive. And, um, so yeah, they printed out pictures of me in spandex and, <laughs> <laughs> and hung them above my desk and made cookies that, you know, said Iron Man and all that. And, um, yeah, totally surprised me. So when I walked into the office and saw this just massive shrine, um, I mean, I just burst into tears just almost immediately and, um, really, really humbling for them to go out of their way to celebrate me doing this, especially when, you know, people don't really get it or understand why, and they can't wrap their heads around it. And so really, really kind of them to, to celebrate it even, even through that. Wow. So as far as the volunteers go on the course, you, have a volunteer band that you can give to one special volunteer. Mm -hmm. Who did you give that to? Oh gosh. I actually didn't give any out. Um, I, I had a few extras because when I was volunteering with mom in um, packet pickup, I had a few people give me theirs, which was so kind. So I had a few extras and I had them in my um, T2 bag and somehow they did not get on my wrist for me to even give out on the run. So unfortunately, I did not give them out. Thanks for Aww. tuning in today. I hope you were able to learn something from today's episode. So what about if you enjoyed the show, please the take a minute course. to leave a review on iTunes or share it with a friend. Funniest Be sure thing. to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Um, if you'd like to see really pictures from this athlete's race, learn more about who I am, um, what I'm doing, or be on the show yourself six, to share your story, really check out my website at CoachTerryWilson.com. Until next time, um, continue the pursuit. A- and that is pretty different. I really appreciated it. But they were like an island party, like a beach party theme. And so you're like climbing this big hill and then you see this girl in a volunteer shirt with like a coconut bra over it and a hula skirt. Um, you know, and she's like hula dancing and like welcoming you into aid station number six. Um, and they had, you know, all these signs that were really punny and cute and so so that was always like a big pick me up um just seeing them like enjoying their job you know wow that was the funniest so as you approach mile 20 to 23 how are you holding up mentally um i i felt surprisingly good um getting to mile 20 is i feel like that's a big like mental step of like, okay, here I have a 10 K left. Um, and thinking of it in those terms, I, I was, I felt really good and really glad, like, okay, 10 K left. And I, at that point was looking at my watch and I'm like, okay, six more miles. This is going to be about an hour, probably a little bit more than an hour at the pace that I was going. And so I'm looking at my watch and I was right around three and a half hours. And so I'm like, okay, I, what I want to shoot for is to go under four and a half hours for this whole thing. And so I kind of set a mini goal at that point um, of like, okay, how can I get through these last six miles of, you know, I'm going to do that by trying to hit, you know, a, a sub four and a half hour marathon, which um, is definitely not a PR for me in any capacity, but, um, it was the goal of the day. I, I would have really liked to go under four. No, hours. I'm talking about like at that point it was the goal right then. It became oh, that yeah. goal. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, and so that kind of gave me strength. And um, really at that point, everyone on the course was just walking, you know, the, the sun was setting and people, you know, I'm on my third loop, but most of the people out there were on their first or second loop. And so just seeing all of these people really beaten down and running by them and being able to like encourage them. And, um, you know, there's something great about passing somebody and, um, just mentally really rewarding about running when I'm seeing all these people walking. And so honestly, that was super, um, helpful to, for me to be able to run my last six miles pretty well. Um, so, and I, I was having trouble like monitoring my breathing. And so everyone that I'm coming up on, like people could hear me coming from a very long way away. Cause I'm like, <gasps> For I mean, probably four miles. So you sound like Forrest Gump over here, huh? Oh yeah, I sounded <laughs> terrible, but my heart rate was like in zone one, and so just something about the emotion and knowing I was so close to the finish line, I just was having trouble breathing normally, and so I was not sneaking up on anybody for those few miles. I can tell you that. So you were getting excited about finishing six miles out. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> even though you have about an hour left you're still getting excited right oh yeah because typically i run stronger at the beginning and then by the end i'm so angry and so like just ready to be done and exhausted but starting out my race my marathon so poorly it made me able to finish strong and that was really just refreshing and a fun feeling wow so if you compare how the run went here versus what you did in Texas earlier this year, I know mm -hmm. Texas is a lot flatter in right. that sense, but did you have a difference in strategy that you wanted to approach this? Um, not really. Um, the, the pace goal was obviously different once I readjusted it, but I always, I mean, really with any part of Ironman, I think you have to split it up and consume it mentally in bite-sized chunks. And so for me, I'm very um, focused on each mile in the run. Um, and so I'm looking at my watch and I'm like, okay, this, this mile, I need a 920. Like, that's it. That's all that I can focus on right now is this mile hitting a 920. Um, or, you know, whatever the, the pace is for that mile. And, and that's what gets me through it because it's just, it's too big to think about. I've got 20 more miles or I've got however, however much longer. Um, and so just go in mile by mile. And so that was the same thing for this race. It's like, okay, this mile I need under 11 minutes and that's it. That's all that I need to worry about right now is how I'm going to make that happen this mile. Um, and so that's been my strategy and it's worked well for me. And I will continue doing that, um, in future races. Wow. So miles 23, 24 and 25, how are you feeling? And are you getting to where you want to be at that sub four thirty? Yeah, I definitely was making it happen. Um, my so a lot of those middle miles, I was, you know, 1030s, 1040s, 1050s. Um, but really in those last number of miles, I started chipping away and bringing those paces down to, you know, 1020s, 1015s, 1010s. Um, and so, and, and just seeing those was, was definitely a boost for me. Wow. So mm -hmm. the last mile here, you finally get to cross that or pass the sign that says to the finish versus go to these loops again. <laughs> How was this feeling? Uh, wonderful. Um, so fun. So fun. I mean, it was dark by then. Um, but it's right where the special needs bags were. And so all my special needs friends that I waved to the last three laps, you know, I got to like wave to them and tell them that I never wanted to see them again. Um, That's so rude. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty rude. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, I mean, it just, it just felt awesome. I'm sure my breathing was even louder um, in that last, I think it was like 0.3 or something um, when you take the to the finish turn. Um, but, oh gosh, just, I could feel, I could feel the tears already welling up in my throat and I'm trying to like, you know, fight them for as long as I can. Cause you know, pictures don't want ugly crying in pictures. <laughs> <laughs> right. So as you actually get to the carpet mm-hmm. and you see the lights and all this, what is the mm-hmm. finish line experience like here for you? Mm, gosh, wonderful and magical. Um, yeah, really when I hit the final straight away and I'm looking at the big arches with the time on it, um, that's really when I typically lose it and like very clearly ugly crying. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely very emotional, you know, all of the work for months and months and months and then all of the suffering from that day just welling up inside you and just physically coming, you know, to fruition in, in that last final stretch, um, is really, really fun. And the crowds are awesome. Like they make such a big deal out of us finishing. Um, and so that just, it's like a dream. I mean, that's the high and that's why people keep doing multiple Ironmans is for that finish line experience of, of doing something so awesome. So, um, I, once I hit the red carpet for me, I choose to walk, um, because you have one moment, you know, it's like 60 seconds that you have in this final stretch and people sprint through it. And I'm like, you missed it. (laughs) You just did this whole thing and you missed the glory moment, you know, like you've got to soak it in and you've got to like, enjoy that. And you know, my last mile pace is like way slower because I just walked to the last a hundred yards, but like, it doesn't matter. Like that's the, the glory moment. And, um, so I, I choose to walk and just soak in all of, all of the, you know, magic from, that red carpet and hearing your name from Mike Riley and all of that. Wow. So Mm -hmm. as you finish, what do you get to do next afterwards? Um, mostly have like a mild panic attack is really what happens. I just, I stand there and I just cry like very hard. Um, and the volunteers are always very worried about me. Um, and so I'm like crying I'm just really just standing there bawling and you know, the volunteers are like, do you need medical? And I'm like, I'm just crying. I don't need medical. (laughs) So I get a little bit sassy in those moments, but um, yeah, just, just a release of emotion and fatigue. And, uh, and I think also just a, like the pressure is off now, you know, um, it's like, it's, it's done. I, it's over. I can't change the race. I can't change anything. And and the pressure of producing a great race is now over. So, um, so I cry and then, (laughs) then I go find my mom, um, and, you know, take my finisher picture with my medal and all of that. And, Um, I always go get a massage at the massage tent, um, which is massively painful. Um, but you know, definitely good to start recovering as quickly as you can. Um, and then normally I'm, I'm hungry and want the cold pizza that's been sitting out all day, but I, I was not feeling well after the race this year. I I was, you know, really happy and, and all of that, but I didn't feel well. And so I, actually didn't eat um for a long time wow Mm -hmm. so after you finish how was your recovery process um sitting in a car for 15 hours is coming up quicker (laughs) than you want it to obviously right right yeah well i fortunately got a great night's sleep so i i went back to our airbnb 
um, after the massage, which is really not typical for me and my mom. We always stay out to until midnight to cheer on all the rest of the finishers because, like, those are the people that are amazing, you know, like – like a 12 hour Iron Man is wonderful, but like the people who have these incredible stories, like those are the people who come in in that last hour. And we love that so much. And so, um, but I just, I felt horrible. Um, and I'm like, I need to go home and I need to lay down. And so, um, we went back to the Airbnb and I was, um, frozen. I mean, just shivering and the thermostat was set at 75. So I, you know, I'm like, why am I, freezing and then I use all the hot water in the shower and then um and then I start burning up and I'm like it is blazing in here like, what is going on um uh, and my face is like massively puffy and you know I'm like holy smokes like I have a fever that is through the roof right now um and so I laid down at like eight and slept like 12 hours um and went to athlete breakfast in the morning where they do awards and show the video and all that, which was fun. Um, and then hopped in the car for 15 hours. <laughs> Gosh. So <laughs> did you realize that a lot of people actually finished in pouring rain? Yes. When did you realize that if you would have walked the marathon that you would have been in pouring rain? Yes. Um, well, after – after I finish and I'm standing there just talking to mom, um, before I got a massage, I, you know, I can feel the weather shifting and the wind picking up and all that. And I'm hearing numerous different volunteers and, and people being like, man, like the storm, the storm is going to hit very soon. Um, which was another just <laughs> actually great thing that happened because that made me like, I didn't even have to decide if I wanted to stay out there at the finish line. It was like, no, 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 I can't stay out here in the pouring rain. Um, but yeah, I'm so thankful <laughs> that I did not have to finish in that. Cause that is just a mess for sure. Great pictures, but it's just a mess. Did your mom go and get your bike and your bags for you? She did. Yeah. So she was... went and got your pee bike and your pee bags. <laughs> She's a saint, I'm telling you. Um, yes, just absolutely so kind and servant-hearted. Um, yeah, she got all of it, you know, and I'm like carrying nothing and she's just lugging around all of my stuff. And yeah, super thankful to have her there on course all day, which is exhausting in itself. And then to just take care of me after the race and get all my stuff was really, really awesome. Wow. So what's something that you learned from this race experience that you want to pass on to someone who hasn't done this kind of race before? Yeah. Um, I would, I would say take race day as it comes and adjust your plan as you need to. Um, I think that if I would have been so crushed that I wasn't hitting my numbers that it could have totally derailed my, my whole day, you know, and was a 12 hour Ironman what I hoped for that day? No, but is it still something I'm proud of and thrilled to, you know, put on my list of Ironman finishes? Absolutely. And that wouldn't have happened if I couldn't have adjusted the plan as, as I, you know, as I needed to with the hillier run course and with just not feeling well, you know, during the day. So, so yeah, take it as it comes and adjust as you need to. Wow. So looking back on it, how well prepared for this race do you feel like you were? I would say the least prepared I have ever been, um, <laughs> honestly, but also I'm obviously more experienced now than I've ever been. Duh. And so those two things together, you know, still, still helped me produce a race that, um, in the end turned out pretty good. Okay. So if you could change anything about your race and do it over again, what would you change? Hmm. Good question. Um, I, I don't think that I made any huge mistakes per se. 
Um, but I, I think that I would have been a little bit more true to myself at the beginning of the run. Um, you know, just being upset is really not, it's just not my 411. And so that was really out of character for me. And I wish that I would have been able to still be true to myself and be, you know, talkative and, um, and a little bit more thankful probably, um, in those first few miles. Okay. So for first timers that are going to do an Ironman next year, what advice would you give them? Um, do the training, (laughs) do, do the training, commit to it. Um, you know, because so much of this sport is mental and, if you put in the training, you get to race day with confidence and then you race with confidence and you race well. But if you, you know, if you're missing workouts and you're, you're not being disciplined about the things you need to be, you get to race day and you're questioning if you can do it. And, and that will come out in your racing, um, and will be really evident. And so, um, do the work, be willing to do the hard things and, um, then then go race with confidence once you've done that. Okay. Well, Bonnie, we've covered a lot. Do you have anything else you want to add about your race? Um, I think maybe the thing that I am most proud about is that I um, negative split my run, which was really exciting to do. Um, so my first half marathon was um, – was a two sixteen, and my second half marathon was a two eleven, wow. um, and I honestly never thought that that was possible for me to negative split my run, and so I was really proud to have come back from starting um, not how I wanted to 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 finishing my race really well, and um, so that was a first for me that I got to um, negative split my Ironman marathon. So. Um, So yeah, that was really the last thing. Wow. So what's next? What's next? Well, Ironman Texas. You're doing that one again. I am. It's in 163 days, but who's counting? You? (laughs) Yeah, I'm definitely counting. And this one's going to be exciting because my little sister um, is riding my old bike um, that I've raced Texas on four times and she is racing her first Ironman. So, um, that'll be really awesome for us to get to race, you know, together, so to speak. I don't know if we'll actually race the whole thing together or not, but, um, but that'll be really fun to have her out there doing her first. Wow. So you've been in the sport for a few years now. What races are on your bucket list? You know, this is kind of sad to say, but I don't really have a bucket list. Um, You know, cost has always been a factor for me. And I think for a lot of Ironman athletes, it's not as big of a factor. But being newer in my career and younger and all of that, I don't have the savings to go travel the world and race these races. And so, um, so far, I've just raced races that I can drive to and that I don't have to, you know, ship my bike and all of that. And, um, so I don't know, maybe when I get a little more money, <laughs> I can start figuring out where I want to go. But right now I'll be staying within, you know, probably a 15 hour or shorter drive. Wow. Well, mm-hmm. Bonnie, it's been great talking to you and I only have one more question for you. And that's what's your definition of a perfect race? A perfect race. Um, great question. Um, I would say the perfect race is. Mm, executing your plan. Um, gosh. I don't know, being, being disciplined to execute your plan, even when things get really, really tough. That's what, like what a horrible, mean? but what do you mean? What, what do I mean? Yeah. Um, 
looking back and being able to say it got really hard, but I still was disciplined enough to race my race that I was capable of. Um, and, you know, finish with, with the time that, that you should be able to finish in. I, I don't know. I, I don't really know a good answer for this question. What do you think? Ah, <laughs> you can't do that. Uh. I don't answer that. So, well, Bonnie, yeah. it's been great. And I look forward to following you at Ironman Texas. I'll be down there volunteering next year for sure. And awesome. We'll be, I don't know if I'll be at transition or if I'll be at the special needs, but I'll be down there volunteering again for sure. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for letting me come talk to you and, um, yeah, I look forward to seeing out, seeing you out there and maybe you'll get a red wristband from me. <laughs> maybe. Well, you have a good day and we'll talk soon. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Terry.